Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests waiting to be profiled are Barry Phillips and artist Christopher Cousins. Actor-director Barry Phillips was trained in London. But what were you trained in, acting or directing, Barry? Uh, acting first. Yeah. And where did you train? Um, I trained uh, in the theatre. Well, actually, right? Yeah, I, uh, I, um, I, I, uh, I, I wanted a grant to go to uh, drama school from my local uh, council. Which was where? Uh, which was in Surrey, Surrey County Council, oh, which is south of London. Uh -huh. But uh, they didn't want to give me any money, so um, I started working backstage in the West End, in the flies and uh, running, you know, great chunks of flats across huge stages and things like that. So that's how you really got that's into really the theatre, really? Yeah, really, yeah. I mean, I knew I wanted to act before then, but it was like well, I didn't quite know how to go about it, you well, know. Well, once you got into it, did you start taking acting classes from pe uh, uh, people? I, yeah, I did for a while. I went to um, uh, um, a part-time uh, 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 drama school thing, you know, that used to be. But meet nothing in. fancy like the Royal no, Academy no. or anything? No, like I, actually, I, actually, um, I actually was accepted at uh, uh, Lambda. But that's when I couldn't get the money to go there, so. So then so you had to do to it. Well, did you want to be a director at that time also? No, no, I didn't. No, I wanted to be an actor. Oh, so yeah. the directing came Directions in when? Came, well, um, just came through with the experience in acting, you know, and sort of thinking, oh, I'd like to make pictures like that. You know. Well, where was your first acting job then? My first acting job was at the Palace Theatre Watford, which is uh, just about 20 miles north of London in Hertfordshire. And I was the rear end of Daisy the Cow. Oh, <laughs> so can you sing? Uh, well, you know. And now? Kinda. Did you do it? <laughs> have you done any musicals? Yeah, yeah, I've done, I've done several, mu I, several musicals in rep. I mean, pantomime is a musical, so there's all those dozens of songs in that. I did two pantomimes while I was at Watford and various other, you know, walk on parts and don't show you we'll go on stage put that on stage and don't show your face and get back off yeah but did well, i was acting, <laughs> acting asm you see that's the kind of thing that happens did you have to to train your voice i had a wonderful wonderful voice teacher called bettina yonick who oh, actually was brought up here in in southern california in la so so you did take singing lessons then? yeah uh, yes i did it was singing and and vocal thing and vote you know to, to to develop vocal power and support so that you oh. can go on and you know so you can do it eight nights eight shows a week that's what i wondered you or, know, or did know. it also help you with your act uh, just straight drama pieces? oh absolutely yeah well she was she, she's an, an incredible um uh, she has an incredible wide range of kind of things that you that she teaches when she teaches voice it's, oh, so uh, she and Chloe. Yeah, yeah there's almost, you know, because, because you get to know your voice so much better, and you learn how you can stretch the voice, and you, you learn how to stretch the text as well, and, and find interesting colours mm. in the text. Because it's interesting, when you say you have to go on eight nights, a w eight nights you have to go on... Do eight shows a week. Eight yeah. shows a week. If you're in the West End, you do eight shows a week, and if you're in rep, you do eight shows a week. I started in rep, and we did eight shows a week while rehearsing the next one. What yeah. happened? Oh, while well, rehearsing as well. What yeah. happens at a matinee? Do you talk in between the matinee and the evening performance? Uh, you usually go back to the dressing room and go... And then, and then you have to... Then, you have to be wonderful at 7.25. <laughs> <laughs> but a director doesn't have to do that. No, but he's running around because he has like he has everything on his shoulders kind of thing, you know. So he's running around, you know, making sure everything is, you know, help me kind of thing. When you, when you started directing, did you look at it from the actor's point of view or did you just um, think of it as a director, director? I mean, did you want, were you sensitive to the actors because you've acted? Oh is what yes, the question absolutely, is. yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, the thing is, uh, the thing is that, that um, I think the director's job, a, a huge chunk of the director's job, apart from interpreting the, the, uh, the play and making the play work, is, is to make the actors look fabulous. I mean, <laughs> So there is no, there is no play without the actor. So. But so the actor has to really depend on you. 
Well, yeah, they do. Um, you know, well, it's a team thing. It's not only, you know, I mean, ultimately the director makes the decision on whether, you know, the actor falls over that chair or that chair. Uh -huh. but, um, uh, but it is, you know, I mean, one work, we all work together. When, to we're, ta when, when we're talking about um, directing, do you let the actor bring any of his self oh, to yeah. the play? Oh, yeah, please. Bring tons. Really? Oh. <laughs> yeah, but see, some, some directors are like t very yeah. tight to the. Well, I mean, there are certain, you know, there are certain tons. things. <laughs> there are certain, um, uh, you know, uh, there are certain things where, you know, one has a. Uh, it's not. I, I hate to use the word vision because it's all kind of so grand. Vision, yes. It, you know, just. That's you know, what I mean, but you do have to have a vision, don't you? Yeah, you do. Yeah, I mean, I know I read a play and, I, you know, if. if, if Apart from wanting and liking the text, if I don't get images, oh, then right. how can I possibly take the text from the page and you know exactly. do the whole thing of the visual and the, and the, and the verbal? So you've acted in a lot of Stephen Burkhoff's um, plays, yeah. and I think you work with him. You have a symbiotic kind of relationship. Um, what's his style? Muscular. Is it? I mean, yeah, muscular, and when, So physical. would you direct it or you act it also? You've done both, right? Yeah, uh, well, I've acted mostly in, uh -huh. his, in his. I directed one of his, well, actually, I directed two of his plays, didn't I? The, I directed uh, East in, uh, in, early ni in the early 90s, which I did originally with him. Uh -huh. uh, uh, we did that in, uh, premiered that in the Edinburgh Festival. But he, as the playwright, does he come to you and say this is how I think you should be acting or does he leave it up to the director or does he direct them himself too oh he always directs them yeah he he he, he writes them for him to to direct and be in oh mostly so he acts he directs and he and he writes and, and writes. he rides a unicycle besides and do you have to follow him too <laughs> oh so that's the that's yeah his. he's uh, you know he adapted um uh he adapted uh, various kafka's the trial and uh, uh in the penal colony colony metamorphoses uh, oh he didn't oh so his so, is mostly yeah. adaptation yes you know and he's directed uh, he's directed um uh, uh, shakespeare's macbeth in, yes. in the very very early days very much different from how one would see a normal you know straightforward production but do you write too so that you can direct it and act in it do I write? No, not that. I just write. I write rubbish. I write, you know, movie rubbish and television rubbish. But, and have they? That nobody wants to buy. So, <laughs> nobody you know. buys. They haven't yeah. been produced. <laughs> no. You I like them though. I think they're fun. You know, yeah. I don't care what anybody else thinks. You'll keep yeah. writing, right? So, uh, yeah, of course. It's fun, you know. I mean. How um, you're directing Alan Ackborn? You directed actually. Communicating Doors, which was in yeah, the Odyssey, right, and got yeah. great reviews, in yeah, which that was I saw. Fun. That was and um, oh, you, you saw that? Yeah, so of course I yeah. saw it. Um, and the new one, uh, the, Things We Do for Love. Things We Do for Love, which is um, what you're doing now. And Alan Ackborn is the epitome of English, what comedy writing? Yeah, it's kind stage? of. I mean, I you know, it's kind of. Uh, he, he kind of sophisticated comedy. This is kind of you know sophisticated and a bit silly as well. You know, there's but one uh, of the things you, one of the things I think you were you're talking about before is that there's layers of it. So well, it's not really as funny as it looks when you first see it. Well, it is. Uh, it is. I mean, it's funny. Yeah, but, but but there's all that underlying stuff going on as well. You know, I mean, when I first read it, uh, because I had such we had such fun doing uh, communicating doors. And you know, and I've seen I've seen his stuff in the West End before I came here. I've seen his stuff, you know, at the National Theatre in the West End of things, Bedroom Farce and Ran Around the Garden and Norman Conquest and all those. You know, I'd seen lots of those, uh, but that that's that's more that's kind of more serious than um, uh, well, Bedroom Farce is a lot of fun. Of course, Have you acted in his? Play? No, I haven't. No, no, I've never I've never uh, performed in an Acorn. Does he direct at all? He does. Yeah, he he writes them and directs them oh. at. Uh, so this is something you know, when they're first produced. Interesting for you to be directing something that he's already directed. Yeah, right? yeah. Be, I'd be interested to see what he did with it. You know. Yeah. Well, how, how do you get? Be, how do you get the feelings? I well, I read the play and it you know and it's oh I love these characters. It's great fun and you know and I can kind of you know I can see it to a certain extent moving around. It's it's a three-tier set we have. It's a basement. It's that much of the basement flat. You just see from the ceiling down about a foot, and then the main, the main flat, Center. and then upstairs you just see from the knees down. So you have all this dialogue going, and you see his legs going, oing, 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 oh. and back and forth, and 
So it's a whole, you know, it's a whole uh, different kind of type of play, really. But what, but the timing for that would be different than, say, a plain comedy on stage, because you've got all these layers. Right. Yeah. But How it, does the timing work? Do you have to do that as well? But it is, it is comedy, though. It is a comedy. I know. I keep saying you know. it like, <laughs> uh, because I think yeah. he's so deep. Well, he is. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> to there's me, always he's like really. There's deep. always a, there's always like a tug at the heartstrings within the within exactly. the context of you know of him cracking us up as well. Exactly, because he understands the, what's yeah. happening. But uh, it's also very. I mean, it's also very very uh, very believable ho comedy humor because of the you know the, of course of the human because of the human condition. And uh, and just the situation with, what, with uh, these people having this English background and working with Ackborn, who's English. Do you say a line for somebody, one of the actors, and say, "Say it like this"? Yeah, sometimes. Do you? As yeah, an well, actor? because it's a foreign language, isn't it? You know. Well, that's what I wondered if you would say like. I have I have one English. Uh, one of the actors, uh, Caitlin, is English, but the other. Uh, then I have a, a Canadian, and the other two are. Americans. So you have so, you do say so you know yeah sometimes because it's you know it's a different rhythm it's that's and, what I was and wondering. And sometimes you put the, if you put the wrong weight on on a phrase then it completely alters the phrase or doesn't make sense with the so context. you would have to and you can't always hear that if you don't really know the subtleties of the language you you've uh, actually worked a lot all over Europe is it different working in LA from England from France say. or what are the differences it's not really different when you actually get into the rehearsal space or it's you know theater is theater i think and you're working with this and actors. yeah and you're working with hopefully good people you know i've got a wonderful cast for this i'm so lucky so is uh, the, is the director's job for you longer lasting than the actor's job where would you be <laughs> uh i don't know it depends if they like this play or not <laughs> <laughs> would you rather this could be, be the end of it <laughs> <laughs> <don't want> <laughs> it could be <clears throat> <clears throat> one thing you did talk about before we leave are the festivals is because that it? I mean, you're I kicking me out already. Already, it's over. <laughs> the the festivals like Edinburgh mm. and uh, no, the Fringe, those. all those are those great. Oh, they're wonderful. Yeah. I and love do you just take regular work, or do you take uh, like on the edge kind of work? <sighs> regular work. Lots of regular work goes there. Lots of you know, like you know, what would be kind of standard type productions. You, you can know, you do all, all of that. Them. I always thought that the festivals were something that Well they are as well. There's wild out there stuff as well, you know. I mean hopefully that's what the festival's for is to take it, you know, to the next take the next step forward in, you know, knocking down, you know, prudishness and uh, you know, <laughs> censorship and all this kind of thing, you know, which Yeah, exactly. To so get it and to see how the audience reacts to Yeah, it. exactly, you know, the 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 audience ultimately chooses whether they want to uh, you know so well, it always of. surprises me at how much the American audience catches the humor of an English play. Mm -hmm. Because I always think the English, the, the Brits are so uptight, and yet they kind of laugh, but not as wholeheartedly <laughs> as the Americans. <laughs> Listen, we like a good laugh as much as the next German. <laughs> so there you are. <laughs> well, those, those plays, I think, Ackborn's like really on top. Oh, wonderful. I, I, I just, I could spend the next 10 years directing. And the Odyssey seems, seems to like uh, Ackborn plays. Yes, yes. Well, they do, they do such a variety of stuff, you know. They don't just, uh, you know, they do plays from everywhere. From what, I mean, Ron's got, you know, just goes everywhere to look for plays. So things, from so here, where do you go? Do you go back to England or do you live here? Where no, I, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to be directing um, um, uh, Harold Pinter's The Caretaker. Where? Once this opens, that's going to be at um, a place called um, Pacific Residence Theatre in Oh, Venice. so you'll be back and you'll be, yeah. you'll still here. Well, You're yeah, I'll be here Los because Angeles. I'll be watching this for a while. You oh, know. good. <laughs> Cracking the whip. Do you go often? Do you go every night and watch that? I don't go every night, no. I mean, I'll be there for <coughs> all this week and the opening weekend and next week. But oh, but after you do. That, you do oh, go. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm going to look for you in the back row. Yeah, well, yes. Yeah. Or will you be I'll in, be in the, the booth. I'll be in the booth. Oh, you'll be in the booth. Oh, okay. Screaming and gesticulating. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Joan. It was Thank lovely you. to be here. Thanks for being here with Barry Phillips. And don't go away because Christopher Cousins will be right back with us. Hi, 
I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with artist Christopher Cousins, who was born on the East Coast and raised in Norman, Oklahoma. Yeah. He has a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Boston University, but it seems there were some other gaps in your career before you started painting. Where, what happened along the way? <laughs> well, I mean, before you had your first exhibit in a gallery. Yeah, oh well, it was a long time actually. <laughs> I came out and, um, you know, I, I was drawing a lot and drawing and traveling and drawing and drawing and drawing and I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do with <laughs> painting and I, um, you know, painting is something I just didn't. I, I well, you took very it in school, deep for me. Right? Yeah. You, I mean, that was yeah, your, yeah. But your it was, major. But I, but I, I didn't want to just be doing figures and port. You know, I mean, I was really trying to find something that I was trying to say, and I was sort of stuck. And so basically, I kind of threw it all out and went traveling around. I worked on ranches for a while, and I did construction. I lived in Mexico for a while. I and I lived in New York, and then I, you know, I did some acting stuff. So I kind of. How'd you get into acting? I, yeah, I knew friends that were actors and fell into it, and so it was uh, it kind of, it was all <laughs> kismet or something. It fell in my lap, really. That's what it you did. were lucky. Yeah, I was very lucky. Yeah, but I've been very lucky in my life. Did you do theater? Yeah, I've done some theater. You did? <laughs> yeah, I've done some theater. I used to do, uh, I thought I wanted to do that. Um, and acting is a, a very challenging, and but yeah. it's an interpretive art for me, and uh, and you know it was always tugging at me the painting is always oh. and literally it was maybe around thirty or so when I literally kind of woke up in an art store buying paint and canvas and just set to work and would have been started working obsessively. But you started working totally abstract, I guess. Well, no. Um, at first, I was doing figurative stuff. <laughs> oh, I was you doing were. figurative stuff. They were mainly mythic religious themes. Oh, that's what I wondered. Yeah. That's what came in right away. Right. That yes, part that did. Into the um, and I, was that because, I, mean, I know your parents were educators, yes. was that an influence on you? Um, you know, I grew up in the Catholic Church, so and, and I grew that. up with some of that, and I grew up completely fascinated <laughs> and uh, transfixed by religious art, a lot of it. Um, but also, I was influenced by Indian art, too, which is strange. You know, well, then why didn't different. you make art for churches? Because that's, I mean, there's right. a lot of art in churches, right? Yeah. Well, I Religious think art. because, you know, that's <coughs> what art once was in, in, that, in the service of that. And art has changed now in, in what it's serving. And, uh, and what I wanted to do with art is not transform a congregation, perhaps, or even transform anybody, but affect an individual. I'm talking as an individual to other individuals. So uh, my work uh, is very personal. And so I, I don't think about what it is going to do to somebody else, per se, but I think about what is honest and, and what I'm trying to create for me, that world. Well, one, one of the things that you talked about when we were talking was this tension between instinct and right. intellect. Right. That's where I thought maybe your parents, the intellect part of it, would come in well, that's as an true. educator. Right. In philosophy. Yes. That um, um, uh, and how do you, I mean, you want it to be the tension, or you're creating the tension for yourself, but how do you know the viewer is getting it? How do you know that I'm getting this tension when I look at this? I, you know what? I don't know. <laughs> I guess that uh, I, I'm feeling the tension. I'm creating the tension for me. And I'm hoping the, the viewer has whatever experience the viewer has. For me, I'm living in a world of tension, to me. I mean, we, we live in a world where how do you reconcile the physical, scientific world model that we live in and, and the sort of creative, mythical, instinctive world that's a part of us as physical human beings. So how does how your instinct take hold of this piece? Well, and it, it, I start off <laughs> sort of in, intuitively with a painting. Uh, I lay down, uh, you know, I take found objects like string or is that, sand. Is that collaged in there? There's some collaged in there oh, underneath the surface of the painting. Oh, it is. And in this one, this one's called Madonna <coughs> con Neutrino, and it's kind of an interesting example of this because it's a, it's sort of a based on those, I, the old Madonna with baby, Madonna con Bambino uh -huh. paintings. Oh, but in this case, bambino. I'm using these, these, these circles, these, this motif of the circle as, as a kind of a subatomic image, but it can be a, a mythic platonic circle image or a planet. It can be all those kinds of cosmic kind of things. But thing. maybe if we know the title, then we look at it and we right. put our that own ideas into to to yeah. it. The other thing you talk about is, you were just mentioning mind and maturity, right? you know, versus maturity. So would this be a very mature 
painting? Is that the idea? <coughs> uh, well, um, I think it, it, it evokes uh, there, there's the the, the the paint painting itself is modern, mm -hmm. but I think there's something, uh, you know, like a Renaissance quality to it, an older quality to it too. So it, it's taking these old values and bringing them into a modern context. And do you think that's because of the oil you use? Yeah, I use, I do a lot of glazing and glazing overnight, glazing. and I and I try to put a, a, a under, underpainting in there that's going to radiate, you know, radiate, be radiant or radiate through the paint. Uh -huh. So, so that it glows. But when, and then I think the title of one of your shows is Sacred Spaces, right. or is that how you paint? All of your paintings are sacred spaces. Uh, in, yes, in my mind, these are symbols. The paintings themselves are symbols, containing symbols, referring <coughs> to this, this struggle to understand the transcendent. And, and, and so there's a, the space itself is sacred within the painting. The painting, oh, the space between the viewer and the painting is sacred. I see. And the context, the space where the, the painting is with other paintings is sacred. Ultimately, everything's sacred, right? Around, you right, know, you know, yeah, so, but you can create that myth I'm hope, around you. Yeah. I'm hopefully. Or that aura, right. I should say. Yeah. Like the or ordeal of transformation. Right. So that is how we get into that. We're transformed by being into that space of your work. I, 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 I <coughs> or does that go really I'm trans biblical? I mean <laughs> it could be very biblical too. Yeah. Well, I think that those are powerful stories. That's a powerful story about any kind of transformation. But it's it doesn't have to be biblical. It could be from any tradition. Um, for me, the act of painting is transformational. Uh, the I act see. of viewing great art <coughs> is it's I'm transformed by it. Um, I'm not, that's true. You know, no, but that's true. Yeah. That's why when you're like so down, you want to go to a museum right. or you want to look at a piece of art or something beautiful, exactly. a piece of pottery, like a stuff here. flower. Right, right, exactly. And, um, you know, but sometimes transformation requires sacrifice, mm -hmm. sometimes some kind of obliteration or things that you want to hold on. It can be very painful. You know, the idea of of you know Heracles burning off his mortal parts to become a god you know that kind of transformation is a painful sometimes violent right. although beautiful transformation too it's but is that what you're trying to show and some of my paintings can be I think violent these tend to be a little bit more serene this, this one's called monomyth <laughs> mm -hmm. it's that's from uh, Joyce's Finnegan's Wake and it's a, a term he called monomyth basically the idea of all myths having one sort of story from all different cultures. And that also has what you call um, textural support. Right. And the textural support to me, I, I just thought it was like um, collaged. But I think you think of textural support in a different way. It is. I, I, a, lot of it's, a lot of it's, I build up with a lot of paint. And uh, for me, there's a, a, a sculptural element in these paintings. There's a landscape feeling uh, on the surface as well in the distance. Mm -hmm. That tension between surface and distance in the painting is something I'm interested in. So are there are a lot of layers in that. A lot of layers. A lot it doesn't of look. It, it, I mean, it looks like it's textured, but it doesn't look like there's layer and layer and layer. Yeah. I, oh, I don't. <laughs> I couldn't even tell you how many layers. Is that right? <laughs> so it takes a long time to paint. It takes a long time paint. to paint, and then I start. I cut into it. I pull things off. I cover, and I do all these different <laughs> things that uh, you know that that. Uh, does does color play a part in these pieces? Uh, yes, I am. Color comes up as I'm as I'm painting the, the painting. In some p cases, a painting. Uh, I see it completed in my mind before I even started. Most the of the color time, and everything? Yeah, on a couple of them that's happened. Um, uh, on other ones, uh, uh, I, as I'm painting, I, just, I did this one red painting. And I was trying to fight it the whole time. I didn't want it to be red. I don't know why. <laughs> I thought it was just a, But it was telling me, look, I'm a red painting. And I was just, and I, and I finally, I mean, it just took months. I was working on it and, and layering. I kept thinking I was going to cover it, and some of the red would come oh, through. Uh -huh. But it ended up uh, staying red. I have a couple of um, photographs of, right. is this the right way? Right. Um, so just give us the, kind of the names right. and this tell This one's us a called Sacred Portal. It's actually a f so. This has been ripped and torn. Yes, I, I, uh, these are this little motif here is what I call the stigmata motif. Part of what um, 
this like, ordeal of transformation is about. I'm uh, putting my hand in front of the stigma, <laughs> but that's kind of how it feels, right, really. Right, right. Um, <laughs> this one is a small painting, but uh, I hopefully, you know, the red is also sort of luscious, too, so it's sort of a sensuous uh, uh, experience as well. This one? This one's called Genesis. Um, uh, this one, it's a smaller painting, but uh, if you see the painting, it's one that's rather large. It's got a kind of a, an eruptive feeling, as if these circles and that space is erupting out from beneath. And so there is a sort of a violence in the birth process in that one. So these are all um, layered. I mean, layered. the white is on top of all yeah. that bottom. Right, 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 right. Okay. And this one is called the, the Pieta. It's based on the, the oh, famous uh, painting of... of Mary, Mary and the, and the, and the, the Christ and the Christ body. There's a very in this one. Still, you can but you see this in it. Yeah, the wounds <coughs> there. And I actually, I don't even know if you can see it on this one, but there's really is the faintest reference to her face up in here. Where I actually did bring in a little bit of a figurative element to this painting. So right that sometimes, top, yeah. sometimes figures do emerge from the paintings. I, I don't usually intend figures so much, but then sometimes they do emerge. Now. How, um, when a person goes to see your work, do they know this background, or are you just expecting them to just see it and... Well, I, I think ultimately uh, what the painting refers to or, or what it comes from is sort of secondary to the primary experience the viewer is having with the painting. I think that, it, that once you have an experience with the painting, you have your own experience, and then on top of that, it may be augmented or enhanced by what the artist is experiencing. Yeah, you know? do you like to uh, mix with your collectors? I mean, do you yeah. like to meet oh, them and know? Yes. Yeah. yes, I do. I love to talk about, I mean, there, there are ideas that arise from these paintings for me, uh -huh. but uh, other people see different things. That's other right. people have different experiences, and I, and I don't think it's intended to have one experience by any means. It's, uh, you know, uh, it, it, these are abstract paintings and right. they are aesthetic arrangements and, and they're to be viewed that way. They're not stories per se. Oh, exactly. And so it's, it's whatever you take away is right. what you take away. And I, I'm so happy you came on the show today to, Thank because you, you really to be explained People look at abstract things and don't understand that the artist actually has some eye, a yeah, brain underneath right, right. it, you know, and I'm glad that you showed your brain. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joan. Thank it was great you. to be here. And thanks for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep writing 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 919017. See you next time. Thanks.